just wait for the live stream. Okay. Now we are, sir. Uh, so thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, council meeting. It's January 13th, 2022. I want to welcome everyone. Um, we have a swearing in, Councillor Borgignon. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Bordignon? Uh, yes, it's uh, it's Italian, sounds French, so it's uh, Bordignon or Bordignon in uh, European, so go with the way you want, Ward. Bordignon. There you go. Perfect, okay. Madam All right. Clerk. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Um, we are here to uh, swear in uh, Peter Bordignon mm -hmm. as our new uh, county councillor representing the town of Blue Mountains. Um, Mr. Bordignon has his uh, oath of office ready. So, sir, I will ask you to read that now. Uh, thank you, Heather. I, Peter Bordignon, having been elected or appointed to the office of councillor in the county of Gray, do solemnly and promise and declare that I will truly faithfully and impartially exercise this office to the best of my knowledge and ability. I have not received and will not receive any payment or reward or promise thereof for the exercise of this office in a biased, corrupt, or improper manner. I will disclose any pecuniary interest, direct or indirect, in accordance with the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II, and I solemn promise and declaration conscientiously believing it to be true and knowing that it is in the same force and effect as if made under oath. Thank you very much. So as a commissioner of oath and the county clerk, I will declare that uh, this uh, oath of office was declared remotely by Peter Bornino in the village of Clarksburg, the 13th day of January, 2022. Excuse me, 2022. Uh, congratulations and welcome to Great County Councilor Bordignon. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Truly appreciate it. I'm just here to support Mayor Soever and to uh, continue on the good work that Deputy, uh, Deputy Mayor Potter had started at Great County. And Heather, I did sign it for, <laughs> for you. I'll send that off to you. Thank you. Excellent. And welcome, Councilor Bordignon. Okay, we'll move on with the agenda now. We're on to number three, roll call, Madam Clerk. Mr. Warden, we have all members of council in attendance today. Very good. Item number four is our land acknowledgement. So I will read. We acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the Anishinaabek, the Six Nations of the Grand River, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, Wyandot, Wyandot peoples on whose traditional territories we gather and whose uh, ancestors signed treaties with our ancestors. We recognize also the Métis and the Inuit whose ancestors shared this land and these waters. May we all, as treaty people, live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all of its diverse peoples. Okay, item number five, declaration of interest. Council, is there anyone with a interest to declare pecuniary or otherwise? Seeing none, we'll proceed. If one does uh, arise during the course of the meeting, I would ask you to declare it at that time. All right, we're on to item number six now. 6A is County Council and Committee of the Whole Minutes, dated December 7th, 2021, and December 9th, 2021. That is moved by Councillor Clumpus and seconded by Councillor Woodburn. Are there any questions, discussion on either of those minutes? Seeing none. Then I will call the question. Is there anyone opposed to approval of those minutes? And seeing none, I will say that that is carried. Thank you very much. Item 6B is a committee of the whole closed meeting minutes dated December 9th, 2021. That is moved by Councillor Keedney and seconded by Councillor Clumpus. Any discussion uh, there? Is there anyone then opposed to approval? and seeing none, that too is carried. Item number C is the Long-Term Care Redevelopment and Planning Task Force Minutes dated December 16, 2021. That is moved by Councillor Robinson and seconded by Councillor Mackey. Any discussion uh, there, Councillor Sowever? Yes, um, looking at those, 
Um, the cost there of um, they talk about a cost of sixty four million, um, and actually in the presentation is sixty four point eight million uh, for the long term care component there, which works out to five hundred dollars uh, per bed which is $100 more than the $400 of bed we heard before. I'm just wondering if there's been another escalation. What do we turn to for that, Adam CAO? Is that a question for you? Good morning, Council. Um, I, I think as we can all appreciate, the, uh, the, the construction uh, valuation numbers are um, you know, continuing to evolve um, in, I think we can expect in the, in the next few weeks, um, some further information from Colliers. One of the first things that um, they will be providing to us after we have um, confirmed a preliminary design is that um, what they call a class D cost estimate. So that will reflect um, what the latest information is from the from the cost consultants. Um, in addition, with regard to uh, the, the the Great Gables project, um, staff did um, say that uh, as a result of that feasibility study, that we would be bringing back a report to the redevelopment committee um, with some more specific Gray County specific numbers. Um, for the, the task force's uh, consideration. Um, our consultants did confirm to us at the time they presented the report that the numbers that they used are what they would consider like industry um, standards, um, not necessarily reflecting the specific um, characteristics, um, uh, labor contracts, et cetera, that, uh, that, that Gray County has. Um, so. There's more information coming, Councillor Soever. I, I hope that that is helpful to you. The, Councillor Soever? Yes, thank you for that. And uh, I'll look forward to that. The other thing I noticed in the chart is that the 64.8 million in the chart in the presentation includes the full amount of 13% of GST. Um, you know, I guess we would be getting at least at a minimum, the 78% municipal rebate on that. Yes. So really, we've got an extra 10% in there that, um, you know, so yes. hopefully we capture that when the report comes back. And the only other thing I have is um, there, there's a, a little bit of a note there on the last page of the minutes. Well, not the last, well, yeah, I guess it's near the end of the, the minutes where it says discussion occurred on public input. Mr. Starr noted this could be an option to pursue and could be completed virtually. Um, and so uh, our CEO did note that an additional report would come back with a recommendation to the task force on next steps. So are we considering um, some more public uh, meetings on this? It's a little bit unclear. Through you, Mr. Warden. Um, <clears throat> as the minutes reflect, that was a question that was, was raised uh, during the presentation. And um, I think it's important for council to recall that at this time, um, council has uh, deferred any action to, to, to determine that they were not going to move forward um, with uh, a Gray Gables project. So whether or not given that circumstance, it would be appropriate to, um, to move forward to um, any more public uh, discussions. Um, I think we'd have to consider the, the merits of that, certainly to, uh, to make a change to our direction on, um, on the Gray Gables situation would require this council to reconsider uh, a previous decision. Yes, that's what I was wondering, Mr. Warden. Um, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Burley is chair of that uh, body. Is there anything that you want to add there before I call the question? Thank you, Mr. Warden. No, I, Kim has done an excellent job as usual. Thank you. Very good. All right, folks, I think it's uh, time for us to call the question. Is there anyone opposed to uh, the motion before you? 
I see no hands, so that I'm going to say that too is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, we have no closed meeting uh, matters, and we're on to item number uh, eight, uh, which is the Board of Health uh, minutes that are dated November 26, 2021. That is moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Keaveny. I do believe we have Dr. Arrow with us. Mr. Warden, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Council. My apologies. My my update will be verbal without camera. Uh, the uh, situation with uh, COVID is the majority of our work uh, since our last meeting, and uh, the situation uh, drastically changed since my last update to the uh, council. Uh, the numbers, as uh, everybody around the table knows, have uh, skyrocketed. And uh, the strategy provincially and locally has shifted from containment, which was quite successful with the Delta variant for a period of months, uh, on average less than five per day. It shifted from containment to slowing down the progress since containment is not uh, possible with a, a variant that uh, has a doubling time of um, uh, for around or less than two, two days. So with this containment, there are three main sub uh, strategies. One of them is focusing case and contact tracing on high risk settings. And that's a direction from the province, uh, including the hospital sector, the first responders and long-term care and retirement home and other uh, uh, congregate settings. In Grey Bruce, we've maintained uh, this focus and we've also maintained calling every single case for initial case and contact tracing and triage. And if the case is related to the sector that is high risk or um, whether a worker in, in, a, in these sectors or a family member or a contact of these members, we will continue the uh, complete assessment and management. And if it is not related to this high sector, we would refer to a central work, uh, workforce uh, provincially. We also utilized uh, electronic tool to send by text uh, and uh, online registration. And any person who did not have, uh, we did not have a, a cell phone number for them, or they did not uh, register through that text, we will definitely call through uh, the traditional uh, call system. So we have managed, uh, even when the numbers went up to 180, we managed to call everybody in, in uh, the appropriate time. And we have capacity to go up to around 300, 350, and we will still maintain uh, this capacity there. So that's the first uh, uh, strategy of containment. The second one is to communication to the public, continued communication of vigilance uh, during the coming weeks. Um, and the third one is roll of vaccine, third dose, and first and second dose for anybody who has not received them as soon as we can. And under this sub-strategy, there's a, a list uh, of the uh, modalities we deliver vaccine in Grey Bruce since they were established last uh, March uh, through the task force and the healthy network and the partners. And uh, the, this list is the congregate settings, whether it's long-term care, uh, retirement homes or, or shelters. And uh, we, we continue to provide in timely fashion and meeting the, pro the provincial uh, deadlines to provide the vaccines to these uh, vulnerable sectors. Uh, we support pharmacy and primary care. And uh, we, uh, we have uh, 19 community centers, 17 municipalities and the two First Nations. And a uh, shout out to the paramedics in, in Gray. Uh, they have been leading in running these clinics uh, uh, during the time we um, allocated our staff mostly to the hubs. And the final modality is the hubs to mass immunization. Uh, our mandate is to provide access as soon as possible. Um, I, I am proud to say that uh, most health units have a plan of providing the third dose during January, February, and March. We have the entire population uh, we provided access within two weeks in January. And that's for the hub themselves without the other modalities. Obviously that does not translate into everybody getting the dose because some people might still uh, opt not to get the third dose, and we encourage everybody to do that. Uh, the um, uh, school sector, there has been a major change as well there. Uh, based on the data and the safety 
in, in our schools uh, safer than our homes. I repeated many times and there's uh, significant data to support this locally and provincially will still stand as well. Uh, due to this uh, safety based on the measures in place that have been uh, implemented by the school and the school staff, um, the, the decision was not to, uh, or not the decision, it was a direction from the ministry uh, not to uh, dismiss cohorts based on cases or outbreaks. Rather, if there is any need to close schools, it will be based on capacity of the school itself uh, and, and the number of people in isolation who are workers in the school. And the rough estimate around 30% if the school uh, staff have been absent based on uh, being uh, a case or close contact, the decision from the school uh, management uh, could be to close the school, but it would not be in involvement from public health. And uh, there has been a, a recent direction as recent as last evening to uh, provide the school and child care sectors with testing and follow up uh, through the operation of, of the, these facilities themselves. Uh, we continue to support these sectors with communication or to ensure their measures are robust if they need any further consultation uh, on that front. Um, and uh, Mr. Warden, there's uh, the uh, high risk sectors, just to be complete in my update, the hospitals, there is one outbreak uh, that is quite uh, minor and contained. Uh, first responders, uh, we, we are in very good standing uh, relevant to what I'm hearing from other colleagues across the province. There are a number, a small number of people in isolation at this point. Uh, Long-term uh, care, we have a, a high number of outbreaks, around 10, and uh, we're working and supporting the homes in uh, doing the risk assessment and managing the outbreaks, uh, the outbreak, the um, uh, the uh, main uh, challenge going forward is, is the capacity in these homes and we connect with them on a daily basis if there is an outbreak on a frequent basis uh, as a group as well. And uh, the, the isolation period can be lowered based on risk assessment to ensure early return. Uh, we, we look at the provincial guideline and the rule is 10 days and that has not changed and there has been some discrepancies or uh, misunderstanding of the guideline. It still stand at 10 days and in Grippers, we've always went with the most conservative. And in this case, it is definitely warranted. Uh, nevertheless, there are multiple exemptions through the guideline to apply and we continue to support the homes, as I mentioned, uh, through, uh, through the process. I'll stop there, Mr. Orden, open to questions as always. Very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Era. Uh, Councillor Desai, uh, I had a question first. I'll come to you next, Councillor Mel. Thank you very much, Warden Hicks. Thank you for the update, Dr. Era. Um, <clears throat> at the start of the pandemic, um, we were told, or at some point during the start of the pandemic, we were told that COVID, like the flu, would become endemic. Um, to me, this meant that we were actively trying to reach a point where the, while the virus spreads faster, it is l a lot less lethal. Um, based on reports that have come out of South Africa, which I get is a different demographic in terms of the age, the average age is almost 14 years younger than, than Ontario. Um, nonetheless, based on the data that's coming out of there, we're seeing that Omicron is basically more infectious, less lethal. Um, Almost 80%, I think as of January 11th, 77.8% of uh, Ontario's population had uh, two doses and 27, 28% had the booster. Um, the odds of us getting to that 95% of the population fully vaccinated are slim to none. Um, if I were a betting man, I'd sooner bet on the Leafs winning the Stanley Cup than us getting to that 95% fully vaccinated. So my question, uh, Dr. Era, through you, Warden Hicks, is other than shutting down every single time there's a new variant, do we have another plan? I, and I'm asking this based on the fact that uh, members of the business community have reached out to me um, effectively um, asking if this is something they should get used to. 
uh, they've suffered. And um, even outside of the business community, I, the, the mental health aspect is something that um, we're um, maybe not paying as much attention to as we should uh, due to the pandemic. Um, and so I, that is my question, Dr. Era. Is there a plan other than shutting down every single time there's a new variant? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the question has three um, points that are, uh, they bring good subjects, all of them. Uh, the, the progress of pandemics in general, like you said, uh, the variants, the new variants, the mutations that uh, are more transmissible will, will uh, be dominant on the expense of the other ones that are not. And also the uh, strains that are less severe will be dominant. And, and uh, it is uh, natural selection. If there are two mutations, one of them uh, is going to make their host expire in a few days versus the other one that is going to be a, a, a safe carry of 10 days than survival. Obviously, the second one will survive and spread more. And that's the case in Omicron. Definitely, the Delta variant was quite the exception because it was more severe and more trans. trans Missable, and uh, that is uh, one aspect of pandemics. They're humbling. Uh, things might not go as uh, probable, uh, but in general, your, your point is is uh, completely uh, correct. Uh, the the COVID nineteen is part of the corona family, also known to humans as common cold, and the only difference in COVID nineteen it was a new novel virus. There is no immunity to it with more exposure to vaccine and or, and or the wild uh, uh, virus uh, and with more strains that are less severe, uh, we're gonna be in the future at a certain point, and this is my own bias, and I believe a uh, um, section of the field would, would have the same opinion. We will get to a point where uh, it is similar to common cold, where you would get exposure to it, you lose the immunity after two years, then you get common cold again. The significance of the period we're in right now is the sheer number of people. Even common cold, if it's gonna affect everybody at the same time, it's gonna uh, overwhelm the uh, healthcare system or potentially, and we're closely monitoring that aspect of it. Um, so that's uh, less lethal. The vaccine uh, coverage, you mentioned 90%. Uh, the herd immunity is uh, out of the cards at this point for the, vi for the vaccines we have. If there are vaccines that can be developed, and by my understanding, there are companies that are developing that and the tweaking the vaccine after we produce it is, a, is, is a, an easier task. It's, it's not a matter of a year, it's a matter of weeks or uh, short months. So, um, so if we have a vaccine that works for Omicron, we can be aiming for herd immunity again. But with a vaccine that is... Uh, as uh, effective as 30% to 70%, depending on the estimates and the number of doses. Even if we vaccinate 100% of the public, that's not going to reach herd immunity. That is not, uh, close to 95% immunity. Um, so uh, again, uh, there are differences among health units, and that's a side point you didn't mention, but uh, the difference between health units is in percentage point, it was not significant to start with, with this new development. Uh, the aim is just to slow down, not to actually contain. The, the core of your question is the last part, is the lockdowns. Is it our only strategy? Uh, uh, and I can say absolutely not. There are other strategies, and, and one of them is slowing the progress that we're uh, doing right now. And if I can just uh, use the analogy, if Grey Bruce was an island, there would have not been need for lockdowns. Education had been sufficient. Everybody's going over and beyond. There is fatigue, but in general, the majority of the public are doing the right thing. If Ontario was as uh, uh, engaged and committed as Grey Bruce, they, there would have not been a lockdown. Uh, but you put the two together, we're not on an island. And if there is a lockdown in other parts of the province, and there's no lockdown in Grey Bruce, we will turn ourselves into a magnet where everybody who needs service, whether it's a haircut or a visit to, to any facility, 
they're going to be coming from other health units to this area. And from that point of view, I can see the wisdom of shutting down with other parts of the province. Uh, the only part that uh, there was controversy about is schools, since the sector is safe. But there is a part of the management uh, that is uh, related to pandemics is related to management of risk perception. If uh, sectors are all shut except for schools, many parents, uh, educators, schools, uh, staff would be quite concerned. And the sheer number of calls and, and uh, concerns communicating to the system, it, it would be overwhelming. And that's my understanding. Again, I was not at the table where that decision was made, where to shut down surgically in a focused way for two weeks for schools and uh, other parts of uh, uh, the sectors with other parts of the sectors. Sorry for the lengthy answer, Mr. Warden, open to follow up if needed. Very good, thank you, Councilor Desai, anything else? Uh, nope, thank you very much, Dr. Hera, for the, uh, for the detailed answer. I, I, I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that COVID fatigue is taking over. Um, I know a lot of people, especially my age, um, they're, they're getting to the point where, you know, that they've said, uh, we isolated, we got vaccinated, we got boosted, and we're still here. So what's the point of any of this? Um, and I, I worry that if enough people uh, get to that point of COVID fatigue, um, then restrictions are, are impractical and, and therefore by extension ineffective. And, and that is my worry, my concern. Uh, but thank you very much, Dr. Hera, for your detailed answer. Thank you. Next is Councillor Mill. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and good morning, Mr. or Dr. Era. Uh, my question is uh, related to uh, thinking locally here in, in Gray Bruce. Uh, up until, I'm going to say, two, three weeks ago, daily new cases seemed to be the barometer or the thermometer that people were using to gauge or is, is the virus getting you know, worse or better, the numbers in our local area and but given the uh, directive of the province now and and locally indeed to restrict the number of tests that are being given to people that think they have uh, the virus i'm wondering is that daily number still a fair or accurate barometer as to whether the virus is getting more prevalent or less prevalent in the area or is there another metric that people should be looking at to kind of gauge where we're at in the in the pandemic Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, definitely not a, a good metric at this point. And uh, in, in general, number of cases is not a robust metric, even, even before the recent change in three weeks and, and explain why. But before I go there, there are other metrics and we always look at all these metrics and we look at the most robust of them. If you can uh, picture with me a, a bell-shaped curve, which is the epic curve, there is an increase and there is a decrease. And if there is a measurement of uh, or, or testing of people based on symptoms, you're going to see a shape. If you test everybody with symptoms with, without symptoms, you're going to see a similar shape, but bigger, larger in magnitude. If you test people who go to the hospital or people who are hospitalized, that's going to follow the same shape, but it is smaller and it's more robust. The, the most robust shape is the uh, mortality, the, the death count, because we know exactly that person is actually not false positive or false negative. That is COVID, and they went through the system. And, and you know, it, it's, uh, it's unfortunate in any time when you, when you uh, see it happening, but as a metric, it is the most robust. Um, when we started the pandemic, we had a case definition, and case definitions have, have that utility of making the assessment or the metric robust, only people who travel or have symptoms. Then after any people who have symptoms, because the, the virus was not coming from outside of the country, now it's seeded. Then at some point, there was some decision to test everybody. And, and that is definitely not the, the best use of these tests. It increases the false positive, distorts the metric, and the... Uh, uh, can increase the false negatives if, if depending on a type of test. So it was not the most robust metric in, in, in many ways. And we've seen that because on certain days, uh, there are a spike, there are less on the others. 
And if you have testing in long-term care or in congregate settings on one day, 500 tests, you're gonna get by definition a number of them uh, false positive or so. Um, going back to the core of your question, it is not a good metric at this point. We can adjust for these decrees to uh, relevant to the high risk settings. And uh, despite that adjustment, we need to look at the most meaningful uh, metric at this point, which is hospitals, hospital uh, increase or hospitalization cases, and uh, unfortunately deaths as well. Um, and if I may add there, there were a couple of layers why this metric was not robust. The decision was made about two weeks ago to focus on the high risk settings, but um, assessment centers continued to have appointments that they needed to honor. So there is still that testing in, in big volumes. And, and you get the question multiple times, do we have 180 in the high risk sector? And the answer is, is no. But in, in general, and this ties into the previous question, uh, if we're heading to endemic and there is no way not to head to it because all pandemics end and, and, and endemics or, or in, in, in general, it's gonna be endemic. Um, we don't need to focus on those numbers. We never focused before 2019, how many people had common cold or not, or how many people had a certain disease or not. There are specific diseases that, uh, that are significant, whether it's meningitis, or for the hospital sector, the flu and long-term care, the flu. But in general, those numbers at some point need to be managed for risk perception point of view to encourage the public to abandon looking at these numbers and uh, focusing on what's, what matters to uh, bridge ourselves into that uh, endemic state, uh, at, hopefully in the near future. Thank you, sir. Okay, next is uh, Councillor Salever. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, um, speaking of hospitalizations and deaths, um, I could notice, help but notice yesterday's report, situation report, that we now have uh, 12 people in hospital, which is the highest it's been for a while. And also the number of deaths went up by two from the day before. So um, I'm just wondering, would you like to comment uh, what, what kind of, what age of people are being hospitalized and dying? Mr. Warden, uh, the majority of these hospitalization are people who are not fully vaccinated. Um, there are a couple of them who are vaccinated and one of the deaths is vaccinated, but uh, they, uh, they had uh, immunocompromised condition that would make the, the vaccine as null. Uh, the, the rest are not fully vaccinated, including the other deaths. And uh, there is similar to the previous uh, metric I spoke about, the hospital admission has been uh, under refinement over the past uh, two weeks. Uh, the hospitals were encouraged to report uh, the number of cases and there has been reporting of anybody who's admitted to the hospital and tested positive and that's not the purpose. So the chief MOH uh, about seven days ago introduced uh, an algorithm for hospitals to follow. So we would get only the admission based on uh, a person's being treated for COVID. And until this day, I can see that that number is, is, uh, could, could have some artifact in it. Um, in general, based, back to your question, we have a high number of hospitalization, but the sample size in, in Grey Bruce uh, remains small to infer, to make a conclusion that this is Omicron driven increase and uh, it's going to overwhelm the system or it's just uh, a small number of uh, incidents in grave rules that led to people ending up in the hospital. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next is Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden, and good morning, uh, County Council, and Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, thanks for your report, Dr. Era. My question is around, uh, you had alluded to emergency services uh, when you spoke to us. I guess my question is, how do we weigh the risk around a shortage uh, of emergency personnel versus the spread of, uh, you know, Omicron? You know, if uh, response times are delayed, then there's certainly a, a huge risk of fatalities. 
And I guess my question is, does it outweigh the spread of Omicron may not uh, outweigh the risk that would be involved with a shortage of, uh, of EMS? And the other question is around, uh, you know, our snowplow operators, if someone uh, has tested positive, would there be a way, if they're uh, asymptomatic, would there be a way of uh, having them isolate in their truck and isolate at home so they can still uh, do their job? Thanks. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, an, a question that brings two excellent points, and yes, on both. Uh, we, we support the services to ensure capacity is, uh, is there. Uh, at this point, there isn't many people in isolation, but if the need be, we have arranged from day one in the pandemic where uh, physicians or nurses or paramedics uh, work uh, in isolation. We arrange, we provide the parameters for that work to, to ensure safety. And uh, um, the, the example, the question you mentioned is actually a true example from two days ago where uh, a snow plow driver tested positive and there is with the with the recent weather events the need for them to be on the road and I personally made the exemption for that driver to uh, to drive while uh, being a case uh, so long there are certain parameter reporting when they get to the truck and when they uh, leave the truck if there's any incident on the road that they require them to have any contact with any person and uh, they, they work with the fire department uh, we have optimal collaboration in Grey Bruce, and that's where I feel very comfortable that uh, there is no need to go to uh, the easy solutions before exhausting all other measures. And we have the capacity in the health unit to support all these facilities and services, whether it's in long-term care, in, in fire police, EMS, or essential workers, uh, in ensuring that they're making decisions that are uh, balancing between safety and capacity. And Councilor Mackey. Next is Councilor O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good morning, Dr. Era. Um, similar to Councilor Desai's comments, um, I, I worry a little bit more about the misinformation, so maybe you can confirm or deny a couple of things. Um, People are telling me, you asked us to get vaccinated, we did. You asked us to get a second shot, we did. You asked us to get a booster, we did. And then you shut us down. And then yesterday, I think it was, CTV had a statistic out that 40% of the hospitalizations uh, were people being hospitalized with COVID, not necessarily because of COVID. And the other statistic is uh, over 90% of hospitalizations are with the unvaxxed, uh, which means that we're catering to them. And so I, I just wonder about those two stats to begin with. Thank you for the question through you, Mr. Ward. And uh, definitely the, these uh, uh, stats are, are accurate. Uh, and I mentioned the hospitals uh, reported, then when you see the numbers, we always verify, is this, is this a robust measure? Locally, before the chief MOH uh, put forward that uh, algorithm, we were um, we were designing a metric where any person who's receiving viral antiviral treatment in the hospital is reported as a case because that's very robust. Nobody's going to get that treatment unless they are suffering of COVID as hospitalized uh, reason or for admission. Uh, again, the algorithm from the province is being used for the past week and we will continue to see if this is um, reflective of, of the what the metric is, is measuring but again it's not the only metric the ICU uh, metric is, is robust the the death we have not seen that sharp increase in death or uh, not sharp uh, th that's reflective of the omicron uh, cause but uh, you know it's a fluid situation and if I zoom out of it completely, um, for the past three months, our messaging in Grey Bruce is to uh, is educational. Just people know the drill, know what they need to do, know how to take care of themselves. In the past four weeks, the change in the in the uh, numbers provincially and uh, some increase in the hospital. Again, is it an artifact? Is it going to continue? Is it going to plateau? Is it going to go down? 
all these things are going to decide what the next step is. Uh, if if we were in in Grey Bruce again, I would have absolutely different approach to this because there is nothing worse than putting an order on somebody who's already either compliant or already fatigued enough that it's not going to be practical. And that happened uh, in few in many parts of the province where MOH has put Section 22 uh, in this stage of the pandemic where there is fatigue, and and that never really. Um, increases compliance, it, it rather burns out people who are compliant. Okay, if I could, Mr. Warden, um, just uh, one more here. And I know, Dr. Ara, I'm, I'm almost asking you to speak for the province here, but, uh, and I know you don't like talking about what's going on in the United States, but this is what, this is, this is what the mental health issue is, is that, that people are watching um, you know, an NHL game in Chicago with 20,000 people shoulder to shoulder, they zoom in on the crowd. No one's wearing a mask. I watched another one in Colorado, shoulder to shoulder, no one wearing a mask, a football game with 60,000 people at it and shoulder to shoulder and no masks. And you watch the Toronto Maple Leaf game and there's no one allowed in the rink. And we're dealing with the same virus. So the, the questions that are being asked is like, what are we doing that is so different than what's going on in the United States? It's the same virus. We're shut down. We can't go to a restaurant. Our kids are out of school. Um, the frustration is building. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I've, always, I've always stood by the science. And, and whether it's the province or the federal government, at the end of the day, I... My mandate is the public in Grey Bruce, and I report to the board of Grey Bruce. It's an uh, it's, uh, independent uh, governing body. And, and again, my oath as a physician is for the, the, uh, my patient, Grey Bruce community. Um, in, in December, uh, the system focused on Omicron as an extreme threat. And since then, till this day, I would say I need to see the data. We need to respond to the data. There has been increase in number of cases. Uh, again, is there an increase in number of hospitalization? Is it going to be high enough to overwhelm the system? We don't want to wait till the last minute till that happens. And again, we're receiving provincial data. The local data is a small sample. I can't make the decision based on it. And it's not, it's not like I can or not. It's not appropriate to infer and make conclusion based on small numbers. The numbers we're receiving from the province and I, I have trust in the system. And I see how when it is reported high, somebody went back in, whether it's the MOHs ourselves uh, asking for clarity or, or our provincial colleagues double checking these numbers. And it reflected that there is an increase of 50%. Um, again, you know, like, is this a clear indication that there is no issue? It's not. So we just need to be patient, all of us. And follow these signs, follow the data. And if there is more, more data suggestive that Omicron is going to require uh, more measures, we will put uh, measures that are reflective of the situation. And if the situation reflects data or the data reflects a situation that uh, this is heading into an endemic, uh, it, it will be uh, an earlier uh, ending to this pandemic comparing to the Delta. It's worth mentioning that their Omicron did us all a favor by getting rid of Delta. Delta is a severe disease that would have stretched longer. Um, in all cases, uh, I, you know, I, I don't sit at the provincial level to see the data there, but what I'm seeing right now requires us to, to uh, examine a bit further. And for local data then with the, with the hub that's going on at the Bayshore Community Center in Owen Sound, um, I think you said if we if we use the back halls of the arena, you could put eighteen hundred through a day, and if you use the arena floor, you could use you could put three thousand people through a day. Are we putting the three thousand through a day? Tomorrow Friday, through you, Mr. Chair. Tomorrow Friday, there are three thousand people who will go through, but that's the exception. Most clinics are not even filled, either you know, ranging between a hundred to five hundred. Um, but, uh, you know, our mandate is to provide access as soon as possible, and we're doing this. Right. Okay, thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you. <clears throat>
Okay. Um, still on the minutes. Uh, Councillor Patterson, is there anything that you wanted to add? Yes, there is. Uh, thank you, Warden Hicks, and good morning, County Council. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, we're looking at the November 26th uh, meeting minutes, and during that meeting, the board endorsed a letter from the Windsor-Essex Health Unit to the Ministry of Health. We supported this request to the province to provide one-time funding for recovery and catch-up efforts over a multi-year period. Once this pandemic is over, there will be a lot of work required to bring all public health programs and services up to full operating capacity. The board also unanimously agreed to send a letter to Mr. Ashley Chapman to thank him and the Chapman's ice cream team for the continued support to our community in its response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, last, the board has a full complement of members. We have our four Gray County representatives. We have Warden Hicks, uh, Councillors O'Leary, Millen, and myself. We have three Bruce County representatives, the Warden, Warden Jackson. We have Councillor Peabody, he is the Mayor of Brockton. And we have Luke Char Charbonneau, he is the Mayor of Saugeen Shores. We also have two provincial appointees with ministry approved renewals. And we have one guest appointee from the Chippewas of Nawash, uh, Nawash Unseated First Nation. And that is Nick Saunders. That's uh, just a brief update. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other hands. So with that said, I'm gonna thank you very much, uh, Dr. Era for joining us. I know you're a very busy man and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, it's time to call the question on the long care, long term care, excuse me, on the Board of Health minutes dated November 26. Is there anyone opposed? Seeing no hands, I will say that that is carried. Thank you very much. Item number nine, we have no bylaws, so, so we'll move on. Item number 10, good news and celebration. Uh, Councillor Burley. I'll go to you next, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I just want to say with great uh, ambition and so on is that uh, George and Bless have sold our international airport. We look forward to the new owners uh, really doing great things for Grady Bruce counties. And uh, it's just an amazing thing that happened and we're very proud of it. And it's great for Grey County. The other thing I would like to introduce uh, to Grey County is our new uh, CAO, Cynthia Fletcher fantastic lady and we look forward to working with her in George Bluss and at the county level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Burley. Uh, where was your CAO uh, previous to this? Uh, Peter Burles, where'd she come from? Okay, thank she, you. she has moved into George and Bluss too. Well, welcome to the county. Uh, Councillor Robinson, you are next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, Happy New Year and good morning to all members of council. I'm treating this uh, good news and celebrations as a very heartfelt uh, thank you uh, to the following. Early in January, one of our communities in West Gray, namely Aiton, experienced a fire. So I do want to extend a heartfelt thank you to uh, West Gray Fire and Chief uh, Phil Schwartz, West Gray Police and uh, Chief Martin. I also want to extend a thank you to Kevin McNabb and the Gray County uh, Paramedic Services, Barb Feedy, and Gray County Social Services, Anne Marie Shaw, Gray County Housing, Victim Services, Red Cross, and other community partners, the firefighters from neighboring municipalities, and also a heartfelt thank you to our um, West Gray communities for rallying together and uh, supporting those affected by the fire. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Robinson. Uh, do we have any other hands? Seeing none. We'll move forward then. <clears throat> Item 11 is uh, the adjournment. It is moved by Councillor uh, Mill and seconded by Councillor Carlton. Uh, anyone opposed? Let's see anyone? So that's carried. Thank you very much. Um, we've been sitting for 15 minutes, so I'm going to suggest that we take uh, a short break.
um, we come back, we would take the 10 minutes. Let's come back at uh, 11 o'clock and we'll move into a committee of the whole at that time. Is that okay with everyone? Hopefully it is. Okay, so we'll see you back at 11 sharp. Just a reminder, uh, microphones and cameras off, please.
Thank you, Olivia. You'll let me know when we can start. As long as Heather Morrison believes that everyone is returned, then we are good to go on the live stream. Okay, Madam Clerk, how are we looking for quorum? You do have quorum, Mr. Warden. Excellent, then perhaps I will get us started. Uh, so I'll call this meeting to order. We're now meeting as a uh, committee of the whole. Um, <clears throat> is there any declaration of interest uh, from anyone? Seeing none, once again, I would ask that if one does uh, come up during the course of the meeting that you announce it at that time. Uh, item number three is a delegation from Mr. Phil Dodd, Executive Director of Keystone Youth Child and Family Services. He's going to update us on children's mental health uh, services. Is Mr. Dodd with us? There he is. I apologize that we are running uh, later, but thank you very much for being with us, and you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Um, I, I did get a chance to pop in and listen to Dr. Ara, and I could listen to him for hours, so um, I have no problem waiting and listening to the information he shared with us all. Um, so I, I wanted to, uh, Barb Fetty and I had a, a good conversation back some months ago and uh, thought it would be a great opportunity to present to Council Keystone and Children's Mental Health and, and what we provide in, in Gray County for, uh, for everyone here. So uh, that was kind of the impetus for me coming, coming this morning. So. Um, <clears throat> so I, I do have a bit of a PowerPoint and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time just reading word for word through the PowerPoint and Tara's going to, or someone's going to go through the, the slide deck with me. Um, but I, I hope that people did have a chance to look at it. If, if you didn't, I'm sure it's available on your, your package and our website is also available for anyone that wants to follow up and and dig deeper into any of the services or programs that Keystone does offer. Um, so if you wanna to go to the next slide. So Keystone is the lead agency for children's mental health in, the, in Gray and Bruce County. So we cover both counties in, in our geographical area. Um, we are designated the lead agency, one of 33 in the province of Ontario. Um, and we provide a, a wide range of counseling, prevention, well-being services across, across the continuum. And our age population that we work with is zero to 17. So up to your 18th birthday. Now, having said that, if we're involved with a, a family and a young person who is 17 turns 18, we continue to work with that young person until uh, service completion of the work that we're involved in. Next slide. So we're, we're located uh, across Gray and Bruce. Our main office sites are Owen Sound and Hanover. Um, we do uh, embed ourselves in other sites throughout Gray and Bruce County. And we're very fortunate to be involved uh, primarily in the family health teams and the CHC and Markdale. And we've signed on to the new center in Dundalk as well to have a site. Uh, so we, we have a belief that if a young person is in distress, the family typically will reach out to their primary care physician or family doctor. And for us to be able to uh, be embedded or in close proximity to those family doctors is very important to us. And, uh, and we have that quick communication back and forth. And it, it just makes a lot of sense for us to be located in, in those types of settings throughout Gray and Bruce. Uh, next slide, please. Well, I, that other slide also indicated we, we see approximately 1,600 uh, young people and their families per year with our complement of about 15 counseling staff that we have uh, available to our resources. So just uh, again, going through some of, the, some of the programs and services we offer. So counseling is, is our core, it's our mandate. If you, if you will, we don't really have a mandate per se. Uh, mental health counseling is not mandated in the province of Ontario. It is a, an opportunity that is available to people. Uh, people have to voluntarily want to be a part of our service. 
but we counseling is is the core piece of what we do uh, with our resources within Keystone. We also provide a, a wide range of educational and parenting workshops uh, for families, for parents, for young people, for service providers who are who are needing any information related to children's mental health. Next slide. Uh, we also have a live-in treatment residential program located in Owen Sound. Uh, it is a, a seven-bed co-ed unit, um, and its primary function is assessing, stabilizing, and treating young people, the highest risk young people that we see within the Grain Bruce borders. Uh, the majority of admissions to our live-in treatment program are young people who are experiencing extremes in their mental health issues of depression, suicide, uh, eating disorders, um, severe anxiety. Those are the, the primary uh, admission criteria to our living treatment program. Keystone also partners at the present time with the Grey Bruce Health Services, and they have a two uh, bed unit on the uh, at the hospital and Keystone staffs that unit with our child youth worker staff at the present time and, um, and work in partnership with them. And if young people, that's the highest level of acuity, if they end up in that unit, they often would transition down to our living treatment program where we would work with the family and the young person to move them back into a step down in their home or wherever is necessary. Next slide. <clears throat> so we do participate in a lot of early intervention prevention services within the continuum of Keystone and primarily uh, six years of age and under. We feel very strongly that the investment in the early years is, is crucial to setting off a trajectory for a young person and for a family uh, to move forward in a positive manner. So we do invest heavily in, in services to to that younger population. Uh, so we have our, our Healthy Beginnings Program, our Cradle Link Program, and that, this is one where we have over 30 volunteers, and, it, and I'll share this, hopefully not outing anybody, but primarily our volunteers are retired nurses, retired uh, teachers, and these are people that go into the family home of a newborn in a high-risk scenario and assist the parent in, in working through the first year of life. And uh, they do the work of uh, approximately 60 full-time equivalent staff um, if this were a paid service. So they are volunteers in our cradling program. Uh, one, of the, one of the most satisfying programs that we offer within Keystone. Uh, we have our parent mutual aid sites throughout Gray County and Bruce County. Uh, we partner in early on centers in Gray County, and we have our building resiliency program uh, through Gray County as well and supporting uh, those, those children in the daycare centers and the staff in the daycare centers. Next slide. Keystone also is the coordinated uh, access mechanism for Gray and Bruce County, and this is uh, an administrative function where we have the most complex mental health. Uh, young people are presented to uh, a committee, and the committee works to provide a, a treatment plan or a service direction plan for those young people, and this is a funding mechanism as well. Uh, the Ministry of Children, Community, and Social Services funds the, uh, the opportunity for these most hard to serve young people to reside uh, either outside the home in what they're called outside paid resources uh, in a group home type setting where the family is no longer able to uh, have the young person in the home because of their their uh, needs are far beyond and outreach the capacity of anyone to parent in, in a home. We also provide and through this program respite services for to keep those young people in the home as much as possible. So it's a it's an opportunity, a funding mechanism uh, to, to, to try to support those most high needs uh, children and youth in Graham Bruce. 
Uh, we are the coordinated service uh, planning organization for Gray and Bruce as well with the special needs strategy and coordinating service planning is a part of that. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder uh, support is a part of that as well. Um, we provide services through youth justice and are involved with uh, our partners in the youth justice system to uh, support young people who are in the court system. And we also have specialized psychiatric and, and assessment consultation services in Graham Bruce and utilize telepsychiatry. We have two child and adolescent psychiatrists in Graham Bruce. And uh, we also provide psychological assessments um, on a very sparingly, but uh, uh, priority based uh, throughout Graham Bruce as well. Next slide. So accessing Keystone is really simple. You just call and you do not need a doctor referral to become involved with Keystone. Parents can call us uh, at any time. Uh, we do a, a screen and we give them an appointment time as soon as possible within our, our mechanism to enter our services. Uh, we do take referrals from doctors and, and we work, of course, with all of the child and youth serving organizations in Gray and Bruce, the Boards of Education, the Child Welfare System, uh, Youth Justice. Um, so we, we do accept referrals from anyone, but at the end of the day, we have to have uh, the family be willing to work with us. And so we reach out to them and, and if they're willing to work with us, we get involved as soon as we possibly can. Next slide. So, Currently, and, and again, following Dr. Ara and, and his presentation with respect to COVID, uh, we are seeing, we continue to be open operational as an essential service in, in Gray and Bruce. And we do see young people and families in person still in our main office sites uh, by appointment only. We do uh, a lot right now on the remote level. So a lot of Zoom uh, meetings. And we also do some telephonic uh, counseling services as well. So this is just a, a quick snapshot of some data that, uh, that you can take a look at and, um, and peruse. So we're, we're currently with Gray County. I focus just on Gray County here where we have, when I, when I did this slide up last week, we're open and active with 526 uh, families in, in Gray and Bruce uh, right now. And you can kind of see the heat map of where uh, the majority of those, those cases reside with our service. Our building resiliency program, we're involved in 36 unique situations there. Um, and I, I did check that, that box as well in terms of the young people born before uh, 2016, which would put them in the in the six and under range, so we're 67 uh, involved there. Now the data element I did not put in here is uh, another service that we provide for Gray County that is funded by Gray County uh, in our social initiatives program. Um, and that is our intensive uh, service delivery for uh, families living in, in Gray County. Um, and we have approximately 60 families that we're involved with in an intensive wraparound service delivery within Gray County Borders um, that, uh, that are funded by the social initiative fund that Gray County supports Keystone in operating. Next slide. And this is the last slide, uh, just, just an identification that COVID has certainly created a, a new world for us in, in our operations and the work that we do throughout uh, Gray and Bruce. And uh, it, it's had quite an impact on everybody and we recognize that. I, I would say to you that, again, just a quick scan last week when we looked at our data, typically we receive about 30 to 33 referrals on average uh, during a week to our service delivery. In the past uh, several months, we're, we're peaking in the 60s in terms of the number of referrals that are coming into our service. 
So we, we have seen a huge uptake in, in the recent months. And I think it is uh, reflective of what I think everyone is identifying. It, uh, I hear mental health, mental health, mental health on a regular basis and in lots of different quarters these days in the press. Uh, so I have a lot of opinions on that and, and how that's operating. But, uh, but yeah, it, it has certainly taken a toll on the volume and the, the increased workload that our staff are, are taking on at the present time. So I'll, I'll kind of end that part of the presentation here. And I, I would absolutely welcome any, any questions or thoughts or suggestions, ideas in terms of Jones Mental Health and Grapers. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Don. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, I'll start with Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you, Phil, for the presentation. Uh, you just touched on some statistics, uh, like the most recent ones. I'm more interested in this the, the 1600 number. What would is that a consistent number, 1600 a year, or what would that number look like? say five, six years ago, are we heading in the wrong direction? No, that, that number has been pretty constant over, over the past seven years is the data that I collect on, on that. So that number has been pretty constant. Um, it, when you compare that though, and, I, and I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that according to the experts, and I'm not exactly sure who the experts are, but uh, there are, one in five young people in experiences some form of mental health concern. So 20% of our population. And when we look at, and, and I, I, I didn't narrow this down to Gray County, but I, I can talk to you in terms of the number in Gray Bruce. So approximately 33,000 young people in Gray and Bruce County um, under the age of 18, 18 or younger. And we're seeing about 1,600 of those if, if truly the, there is a 20% uh, population that's struggling with a mental health issue, then there's about 5,000 young people in Gray and Bruce that don't come through the doors on a yearly basis through Keystone. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't identify that the school boards in Gray and Bruce have mental health services. There are other family health team um, counseling services out there as well. Uh, so there the adult mental health services through the CMHA uh, and the, the adult system through the Great Bruce Health Services and the, the hospitals in Great Bruce also see a, a large number of young people. And uh, so there's a wide range of service delivery. Our child welfare partners also see a, a large number of, of young people in their services as well. So we don't see everyone uh, but we, we do the best we can with the resources we have to try and meet the needs as best we can. But in answer to your quick question, quick answer, sorry. Yeah, the 1600 is about average. I think we're on pace right now uh, with, the, with the last couple of months, the numbers that we're gonna be over 2000 families that will be looking at support and counseling through case Thank you, Mr. Ward. Thank you, Councilor Mackey, you're next. Thanks, Mr. Warden, and thanks uh, very much, Mr. Dodd, for uh, your presentation and uh, outlining all the services. We certainly appreciate the work that uh, you and your agency do for children, family, and youth within uh, the Gray and Bruce Borders. Uh, the Warden, in his inaugural address, uh, you know, challenged uh, this council to uh, identify and look at ways that we could enhance services uh, for both uh, mental health and for, uh, for addictions. Can you just speak briefly to uh, some of the gaps that you see within the service uh, services that are provided in, in Gray and Bruce, please? Yeah, I, yeah, there, there definitely are gaps. Um, I, 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 I would, I would suggest that we look at mental health services as a, as a, a lifespan model. So a birth to grave response. Um, and, we see a lot of a lot of press in the adult mental health and, and the work that they are doing to, to try and manage the addictions and, and mental health issues that are so prevalent uh, across and they take up a huge 
resource, particularly in our emergency departments in Grand Rapids County. Um, and I, I would, again, I, looking at that continuum, the more we can do in the child and youth sector to prevent those situations from escalating to the point where they are taking up a, a huge amount of resource in the adult system, to me, that is, the, that is a great advantage to, to stop that from, from happening. The, the gaps I, I would see, I think there are some chronic issues that have, that have gone on, and this is a provincial, this is not a unique to Gray County or Gray Bruce or, or rural Ontario even, which is my, which is my, uh, my passion when I, when I end up in meetings with the province and in Toronto. Although I haven't been to Toronto for a couple of years and I can't say I really miss it, but at any rate, um, the, the provincial picture has, has chronically been underfunded for children's mental health. We have been the poor cousin of the poor cousin of the poor cousin and the funding infrastructure has just not been there to truly meet the need and the full scope of what we would like to see happen. Um, I, as an organization, Keystone provides the full continuum of everything that the Ministry of Health directs us to provide. So we, we do everything in that line that is asked of us. We provide each and every one of those services. But I would suggest if, if you look at that line, that band of service as a snake, and that snake ate a couple of rats, so in some parts of that band, in that line, we are thick in resource and we do, we have what we need. And in other parts, we're thin. And I, that's a, probably a poor analogy to look at a snake eating rats, but, um, but, I, but that's, that's kind of where I see our service delivery in children's mental health. I, I know in working with my colleagues at Canadian Mental Health Association and at the hospital mental health department, the, the resources are not always there to do everything we want to do. Um, so that, that is one thing I would say, uh, Mr. Mackey, is that the, the, we just do not have the full continuum, the depth and the breadth to do the work that we want to do. We're able to do it. We want to do it. We just don't have the financial resources to hire the staff to actually do all the work and then wait list build, and, and that's not good for anyone in a mental health crisis. There, there, are, there are infrastructure issues that are, that are gaps in our, in our system as well. I, I showed you a picture of our live-in treatment program. It is a 100 plus year old building that is crumbling at the foundation and um, it is not wheelchair accessible. And I have had young people who have had to go to London and Toronto to a residential program because they could not come into my live and treatment program because it was not wheelchair accessible. And to me, that's not acceptable. And we, we have a plan for that. We're working towards a, a new site for our live and treatment to be a part of our main office site here in Owen Sound. Um, we have the space, we have the ability to have it on site here, which makes a lot of, a lot of sense, but it, it's just not, the funding is not, not there to make that happen at the present time. It's a fundraising and we're looking at doing that on our own. We're not seeing the, the government being able to support that necessarily. Uh, so there, there are a number of, of gaps in, in, in the system, I, I think. Again, you look at it in a lifespan model to have uh, Clark McFarland and Naomi Bowden uh, from the Great Bruce Health Services and CMHA and myself sit down and talk about what those issues are. I, I think uh, they would be quite significant in a, in a more in-depth conversation. Well, thanks, for, thanks very much. And Mr. Warden, if I may, um, Phil, you mentioned that uh, you'd be willing to sit down. If Council sees fit in developing a task force or a, uh, a standing committee on, on mental health, is that a committee that you'd be willing to bring your expertise to? I, I would absolutely be willing to do that. Um, I, I think, I think it, the more we can put the issues in the forefront of our local situation, the better. 
um, and and truly identify what the what the issues are that we're dealing with here. Um, it's it's easy to speculate. Um, after doing this for 30 years, I can tell you that from my perspective, I see where the issues and the gaps are and, and what we need to provide a more fulsome fat snake, so to speak. Uh, that's going to be the name of my book, I think, The Fat Snake and How We Got There. Uh, but that could be 40 years down the road. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Maki. Next is uh, Councilor Mill. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you, Mr. Dodd, for your presentation. Uh, from time to time, uh, I hear people expressing the sentiment to me when, when the issue of mental health or children's mental health more specifically comes up. They say to me, yeah, kids these days, they just need to suck it up. When I was a kid, you know, we didn't have all this and we just toughed it through. Well, I'm disinclined to uh, agree with that sentiment, uh, but I'm just I'm, I'm wondering is there any difference, uh, you know, with what we're seeing now than, say, 20, 30, 40 years ago? Um, I, I, I'd, I'd be interested to know your perspective on that. Yeah, I, I, I can share with you after working at Keystone for 30 years, and when I started at Keystone, my job was to do risk assessments for suicidal kids in Gray and Bruce. Um, I, I can share with you that what my staff do today is much, much different than what I did back when I was doing that work. We're, we're dealing with much more complex, uh, intensive, higher acuity mental health issues today than when I did that work uh, 30, 20 years ago. So it's a, it's a different animal. It's a different world we're living in. I, I could speculate on a million different reasons as to why that has changed as our society has evolved over the last 30 years. Uh, I'll have that in my book, um, but, I, but I, I, I don't want to take your time this morning to speculate on why all those, the changes and, and the intensity and the intensiveness and the severity and acuity has, has increased, um, but I can say it has. I, I listened to the my staff and in the reports they give and the situations they're dealing with, they are much more significant than what I did in the first 10, 15 years of my career at this organization. Very good. Thank you, sir. And I look forward to your book. <laughs> yeah, they say you always have to plug the book, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Councilor Robinson, your hand came down, but uh, I, I still want to ask a question. Yes, and thank you, Mr. Warden, and anticipation that you would be calling upon me next, I was prepared to take the electronic hand down. Enough said about that, and I do want to say, Mr. Dodd, thank you very much for a most um, detailed and passionate uh, presentation. Um, I am very, I'm very intrigued and passionate about learning as much as I can about mental health, specifically with uh, with uh, children, youth, and families, and uh, I take note of your point where you speak about um, if there are, and please correct me if I'm wrong, so th this is part of my learning journey, that if um, children and youth have the services they need, perhaps there will not be the greater need as an adult. And, um, may, and also, in the early stages of uh, development of an individual, are you finding that there are services on a... Um, um, multi-use so that it, an individual may be using more than one service. Um, just wondering if you could elaborate on that. I'm very sensitive to um, uh, the issue. So I'm asking the question with as much respect as I can. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, generally speaking, it, the sooner we can intervene, the sooner we can be a part of the the solving of issues and, and supporting parents and supporting young people, the better their trajectory is going to be. And, and it, it doesn't always happen in one shot. It's not a one-time scenario. We see families over and over and over and over again in the course of their, uh, course of their journey. Uh, so it's not a, necessarily a one-time fixes everything. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. It's a journey. Parenting is hard. 
it's it's it never was easy. It, it's always been hard. I find what we're hearing from the from our parents today is that it it feels even harder than it was when I was parenting my my boys. Uh, so it's a it seems like a different world out there to some degree. So earlier intervention and continuing that through through as much as we can through the different stages of development, I, I think are crucial. So I, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I, it is an important piece of what we, we strive for here at Keystone. Thank you. Before I go to Councillor Keaveny, I would uh, uh, say Councillors Mackey and Desai would probably um, know more because it, uh, they're currently on the uh, Great Goose web strategy. But my recollection from uh, when I was on that uh, team, there was a statistic that was mentioned that uh, a high percentage, it was a high number of adults with addictions um, have experienced some kind of childhood trauma. Uh, so it strikes me when we have an underfunding of uh, ch children's mental health that we're probably not, uh, um, you know, putting the money up front it seems to make a whole lot of sense. Uh, I won't need you to answer that, uh, Mr. Dodd. I'll turn to Councillor Keaveny and then maybe in the next uh, answer, if you want to add something to that, you could. Councillor Keaveny, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Dodd, for your presentation. And uh, I think uh, both your comments, uh, Mr. Warden and uh, Councillor Robinson have kind of touched on my thoughts, but um, I was going to ask you about uh, the approach of uh, breaking the cycle, so to speak, and and uh, how important that is uh, you know, to work with children when they are young. And uh, the Warden touched on our high level of addictions here in, in Great Bruce and in that's having on your work. And I wondered if I could ask you, um, and I'm sure it's difficult to kind of measure uh, successes, but I just wondered if you might be able to share with us perhaps one or two uh, good news stories, because I'm sure you've had uh, some occasions when, when you're especially proud of the work that's been done. And uh, I just wondered if I'd ask you to share one or two of those with us. Well, uh, yeah. Um... Absolutely, those are those are the moments in time that keep me getting out of bed in the morning and coming to work every day, or when we we do hear the success stories and the home runs. I I'll, I'll go back to just a quick analogy though before I, I share a story. This work of counseling and working with families it's it's not an exact science. It's a it's an art. It's a craft. Uh, I liken it to bowling. Sometimes you hit a strike. And it really, really works out well. Sometimes you're in the gutter. But then there's always the opportunity for a spare. And I, and I keep focused. In, and if, I can, if we can get a spare, those are the things that, that make me feel really good. Uh, strikes are always desired. But it, it's not an exact science in the work we do. Um, I, there are, I, I could share multiple stories. I, I need to be careful not to identify anyone in some of the stories. Um, but we have had young people who have been into our live-in treatment program uh, on the brink of death based on their suicidal behavior and, and ideation. And I, I can share with you that some of those young people today are um, doing exceptionally well in life, in, in their 30s, um, in their 40s and, and doing exceptionally well in life right here, right now, today. Um, again, I don't want to ident I don't want to share too much detail because I could potentially identify in terms of what they're doing, because I might be potentially identifying who they might be. Um, but we have from all walks of life, and and I, I can share with you, mental health does not discriminate in socioeconomic uh, status. So we have young people from across all walks of life who, who are involved in our organization. Um, and um, again, that, the ones that really touch close to my heart are the ones that were in the worst distress, who were actively wanting to kill themselves. And through our efforts and, and the efforts of the families to come together and support systems around them, the, the schools, the all the, 
it, it takes a village, as they say. It, it's not just one incident. Um, and, and to see some of these young people who are now ex very successful individuals in our community, you know, a couple in Ottawa, like, a, like a, there are some that are just doing so very well and have turned that corner and continue to, to come back excuse me, I, I'm getting a little emotional on this, but they come back and talk to us all the time and, and they tell us. Councillor Keeney, you're good? Very good, yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. Councillor Clumpus. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden, and good morning, County Council, and uh, to you, Mr. Dodd, thank you so much for a very, very enlightening uh, presentation. This is uh, certainly a passion of mine as well um, and uh, a learning journey. Um, and I'm just wondering, I'm curious, uh, uh, first of all, ab about more information with regard to fetal alcohol syndrome and the role that that plays, um, obviously, from birth all the way through and uh, the programs that uh, uh, that are appropriate to, um, uh, to work with uh, uh, those who are afflicted with that. But more specifically, if there are, are programs that, um, because I think this is oftentimes a, a condition that adoptive parents uh, run into in the course of uh, their parenting, their new families uh, that are coming in. And I'm wondering uh, specifically if there are any programs within um, uh, this, this uh, venue for uh, specific to adoptive parents and dealing with the, the specific issues of um, fetal alcohol syndrome, whether or not it's fully diagnosed or simply, um, uh, you know, just the, the characteristics of it coming through. Yeah, that, you, you raise a, a population of young people that is an extremely challenging population to work with. Uh, given the severity of what fetal alcohol does to to their brain dysfunction and, and neurological functioning. Sorry, I don't want to say dysfunction. The neurological functioning of the brain, it, it's a very challenging population to work with. Uh, and it, it necessitates a long-term strategy to, to support and, and work with that family. That in, and in many cases, you're absolutely right. These are uh, parents who adopted children. They are their children now, and they are struggling in when the behavior issues develop in adolescence primarily. Um, it, it's not an easy it's not an easy task whatsoever, and sometimes having the diagnosis is even more challenging because you have to have a parent, the mother in most cases, admit that they drank during uh, pregnancy. So having a diagnosis, a formal diagnosis of FASD is not always possible. But we have seen great inroads in, in psychiatry and psychology in looking at the assessment process around FASD, that they are, they are treating, they are providing a diagnosis that allows for the treatment options to come into play. We work very closely with SOHAC um, and we also are in the process right now of developing uh, more local assessment opportunities for FASD uh, through the London Family Court Clinic. So they, they do do those assessments and we're hopeful that we will be uh, able to work more closely with them to be able to do those types of assessments in Gray and Bruce County as well. So it, it's a challenging area. It's one under development. I would not say we're not hitting a strike in terms of the FASD uh, families that are that are struggling with their children, um, it, it's something we are continuing to work very very diligently on. And our director of community resources, Jennifer Sells, is doing a lot of work in the background to try and and bring the FASD um, opportunities and assessments and consultations to Graham Bruce. Good council compass. Thank you. Uh, council Gamble, you're next. Yes, um, Mr. Dodds, uh, Warden and Council. Um, the one issue that I have seen in our own area tends to be with the older uh, generation 
Uh, they've maybe been had some counseling. I'm not even sure of that. But they be, it becomes a behavioral thing where they, I don't know how you get in contact with them. They probably don't want to come to you or whatever. Uh, is, is that a situation you see very often or, or can do anything with? Yeah, I, t yeah, that, that, that's a great question, Brian. Um, the, yeah, there, there is that population of the older adolescents who do not want to go for quote unquote counseling. Um, very rarely do our staff ever refer to what we do as counseling. We refer to it as touching base. Uh, why don't you touch base with me in a couple of weeks and we'll continue the conversation, that sort of speak. Um, so terminology is important in the work that we do once we do get someone in the door. We, we do work closely with the youth justice uh, uh, probation group as well. Oftentimes we will, those young people that you are profiling may find themselves in conflict with the law, may find themselves in a courtroom, uh, may not end up on probation, but they may end up in a diversion program. And Keystone does provide a, a mental health court worker position. That's part of our youth justice uh, services that we offer. And that's where our, our worker would try to engage them to become involved with Keystone Counseling Service. Uh, as part of our function in the in the diversion of these young offenders, um, so it's a <clears throat> it's 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 a tough population. It, it, it truly is, um, and uh, there's no easy answer to engage those young people. Uh, sometimes it's it's external controls that have to be put in place in order for those people to see that they've hit a point that they need to make a shift in, in their life trajectory. And that's usually the law. Good Council Gamble. Thank you, Mr. Dodd. Thank you, I don't see any other hands. So with that said, Mr. Dodd, I'll thank you very much. Um, a good conversation. Thank you so much for your time. It's a lot longer than we probably thought it was going to be, but. This is an important conversation for us to have. So I do want to thank you for your time today and for your willingness in response to Councillor Mackey to uh, assist uh, Gray County as we figure out what our response is going, to, is going to be in the short term. All right. Uh, oh, Bart Fady, I meant to call on you. Is there anything that you wanted to add to, it, to this? Good morning, Mr. Warden and County Council. Hello to Phil. Um, I just want to say that uh, this partnership that we've had for all these years has been wonderful. Um, I really am, am uh, heartened by the conversation. I think that there is um, some very uh, deep awareness of the interventions that can make a change in the trajectory. We work really hard with our early on partnerships. Uh, those are pieces that help family and children. Um, linking them with other resources. And I just wanted to mention, uh, I'll throw in the Getting Ahead program here too, because we find that if mom and dad are supported and uh, have um, some options and some hope, uh, it really does have a strong impact where the children are going to go as well. So looking forward to next steps in, the, in this project and where we're going to go with uh, your direction, Mr. Warden. Excellent. Thank you very much, Barb. Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden. Uh, and just a question for Barb. Um, the county contribution that uh, that we contribute, has that, uh, what amount is that and has it increased over the years? Uh, the county contribution is just under $100,000 and it has not increased in a number of years. It is in the social initiatives budget again this year. And um, we are um, moving forward, uh, needing to look deeper at what those needs are. So that's part of what uh, the investigation will will help us look at. I know these are chronically underfunded programs from the Ministry of Health. Um, we look at uh, Ministry of uh, Solicitor General. We look at other options where, wherever we can find pockets of funds for to help our partners with these programs. Um, there's just not enough. And we've heard that directly from Phil and uh, fundraising is difficult at any time, but if we could really look at the impact that we're having, those upstream interventions and uh, the importance of those, I think we could prioritize where things really need to have a, a light shone on them. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, again, thank you, Mr. Dodd. And we're gonna move on with the uh, agenda. Uh, we're on to item number four, council uh, looking at the consent uh, agenda, items uh, 5, 8 to N. Is there anything that needs to have separate discussion? Uh, council, so ever. Yes, uh, I'd like to pull items B, C, and L, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, no one else? With that said, then we'll um, go on the consent agenda. It is uh, moved by Councillor Clumpus and seconded by Councillor Milne that we approve the consent agenda with, uh, I guess, B, C, and L uh, being removed for separate discussion. Uh, any discussion there? Anyone opposed? That is carried, thank you. Okay, moving on to the agenda, we're on to item 6A. Let's scroll right down here. Okay, we're now dealing with item 6A, approval of the Old Sound official plan. Uh, that is moved by Councillor Woodbury and seconded by Councillor Carlton. I believe that Scott is going to be taking the lead on that one. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden, and, and uh, good morning and, and happy new year to, uh, to uh, Warden Hicks and members of County Council in this regard and anyone that might be uh, tuning into this. Uh, so what you have before you is uh, a good news story. It's a report on, on the wonderful work that uh, Owen Sound staff, council, and their consulting team in the community have done to draft a new uh, official plan for the city. And I will just highlight that uh, I recall uh, attending the, the initial open house for the city's official plan on March the 2nd, uh, 2020. Uh, and that was still an in-person open house at that time. And, and uh, things looked rosy in terms of the consultation schedule ahead. And, and the city and, and their team there did a wonderful job of, of pivoting that consultation uh, throughout the pandemic, because as we know, it was a very challenging in those early days of the, of the pandemic to understand uh, how our processes were going to change. That all resulted in, in uh, after, after some robust public consultation, uh, the city adopting a new official plan in, in late June of 2021. And so since, uh, since that time, uh, uh, the county has been reviewing all the, the uh, uh, materials provided by the city, including all the, the feedback received by the public, uh, as well as working with, with city staff on, on some proposed modifications. And a number of the modifications, you'll see them in the table attached, are very minor in nature. Uh, some of them are, are typographical or, or, or minor mapping changes, uh, and others are, are slight tweaks to comply with, with either the county official plan, uh, some changes in provincial legislation in the Planning Act, and uh, some changes to the uh, 2020 provincial policy statement. Uh, so my report hasn't done a thorough analysis uh, going through line by line of, of the official plan. As you can appreciate with a 200 page document, uh, that's, that's not really feasible. We have, uh, county staff have reviewed the plan in detail and, and, and spoken in detail with city staff and the city put together a, a very thorough uh, staff report on this, including uh, uh, the, the public and agency consultation. And, and so county staff would certainly concur with, with the, the uh, conclusions of city staff in, in that regard. The one thing I will say, it's, it's interesting Interesting to look at a process like this, and especially in the outreach to the community, in terms of um, what the key issues are that, that we're hearing from the community. And, and uh, the county's official plan isn't that old now. It was only uh, approved in 2019. And, and we did significant public consultation on that. And there were certain issues that we're hearing about as, as sort of, if you like, the bread and butter issues at that time. And, and I could say that some of the largest issues in the county plan were, were housing and, uh, and transportation at that time and, and the availability of, of transit and other such things. In, in the consultations that happened in 2020 and into 2021 on the city's official plan, uh, in reading through the comments, I would say by far and away, uh, the, the most amount of comments came in on climate change. Um, and, and this was a matter that we heard about at the county level previously, uh, but not to the extent that uh, that city did, the city did. And I will say in, in other municipalities that are doing updates to their official plan, it's, it's, it's uh, coming through loud and clear. And so in response to those uh, comments, the city uh, did make some changes to, to the initial draft of the plan, and, and they've included um, provisions in their plan, uh, which now build on, on some of the work that the city's already done with respect to climate change. They've already done a, a uh, adaptation strategy. And, and now through the, the policies in their plan, they're committing to doing a, a, a climate change action plan uh, similar to the county. So that should dovetail very nicely with the work that the county's done. Uh, and so hopefully this will help um, 
um, demonstrate to the public uh, the city's commitment uh, to tackling this matter. And, and that, uh, as I said, it really is uh, one of the matters that's uh, first and foremost in, in the eyes of, of those that uh, contributed comments. Um, with that, I will also apologize uh, for, for my report in this regard. I realized uh, today in re-reviewing it that there were two errors that seem to have occurred in the table. So in modification number 19 and in modification number 23, um, there was some missing section references. Uh, so prior to issuing the decision, should, should council support the staff recommendation here today, we will update modification number 19 to reference section 3.8 and modification number 23 to reference section 6.1.12 sub B. Uh, with that, uh, I'll simply conclude by saying uh, staff are, are of the opinion that uh, with the recommended modifications, which have all been consented to by city staff, uh, the plan has regard for matters of provincial interest under the Planning Act. It's consistent with the provincial policy statement, it conforms to the county official plan, and it does not conflict with the, the Niagara Scarpment plan. So uh, that's all I have at this time, but certainly be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. Council, are there any questions for Scott? I'll see none, then I will call the question on the, on the motion before you to approve the new City of Old Sound official plan. Anyone opposed? That is carried, thank you very much. <laughs> Look at Ian shaking his head. <laughs> All right, very good. We're on to item 6B uh, now. Uh, and that is the homeless, homelessness enumeration and housing supports for chronic homelessness. Uh, that is moved by Councillor Woodbury and, uh, no, my apologies, that's moved by Councillor Robinson and seconded by Councillor Patterson. Josh Gibson, uh, let me take my lead on this. Thanks, sorry about that. Once I started sharing my screen, I couldn't find the unmute button. So I apologize. Uh, thank you, Warden and members of Great County Council. I just uh, wanted to start by saying, um, listening to Mr. Dodd's presentation around mental health uh, and how the two tie together so well with homelessness and housing supports that are required. I think this is a, this is a great time to bring this report forward. So I'm gonna start off today's presentation with a bit about some of the definitions around homelessness and our homelessness response system that we're working towards. Then we'll get into some of the statistics that we found when we did our enumeration. And following that, we're gonna talk about some of the priority areas as well as a recommendation that we have for you today. So I wanted to start with the definition of homelessness. So when we're speaking about homelessness as the Canadian definition, we're talking about uh, people who are without permanent safe housing. Uh, so this is anybody who may be unsheltered. It also includes anybody who is couch surfing, which is staying with friends or family. Uh, could be individuals who are self-funded in a motel that ha don't have somewhere long-term to move to following that. During our enumeration, it was really important to us that we got that definition around homelessness out to our enumerators. So we offered several training opportunities to and as well as marketing material to the community around the definition of homelessness so we could get the most accurate responses. Uh, still, I wanted to point out that there is lots of individuals that have a roof over their heads that do not consider themselves to meet this definition and they would not be included in this enumeration. The enumeration was undertook by something called a point in time count, which is a one day count of unsheltered and sheltered individuals experiencing homelessness. We held it jointly on October 18th with Bruce County Housing as well. So we did Gray and Bruce together for a few reasons. It made it a bit easier for marketing uh, in terms of uh, getting the message out to community. You may have heard some radio ads that we did around that time. It also supported our partner agencies that helped out with the enumeration because so many of them cross county borders when providing services. So allowing them to only take the one day to support us helped out that organization. And this is a good time to mention that was a different method than what was undertaken in 2018. So some of you may recall, we did undertake an enumeration in 2018. 
That was done using a period prevalence count, which is a full week enumeration. Um, so I wanted to say that you won't find in this report or presentation direct comparisons to 2018, and there is specific reasons we've done that. The difference in counting method is one. The major change in landscape in the three and a half years it's been since the last under enumeration was taken. And we learned a lot of lessons in 2018, and we implemented those when rolling out the enumeration this time around. So our feedback from service providers and from the community allowed us to really undertake a more fulsome enumeration. So definition, uh, first definition I'm gonna to talk to you about today is the by name list. Uh, and when we're undertaking enumeration, what we're really trying to do is strengthen a by name list. And a by name list is a full list of individuals or families experiencing homelessness at a given time. So it's putting names to people and what their specific needs are and identifying them so that we can learn how to support them as best we can. The by name list provides us with data to make systems level changes uh, that suit our community needs as best they can. By name list is accessed through many common entry points. So we have uh, community organizations that are members of our homelessness response steering committee, which I'm gonna talk about further. Uh, it's made up of the counties, Grey Bruce Health Services, Mawikwadong Indigenous Friendship Center, the YMCA, Canadian Mental Health Association, Safe and Sound, and Southwest Ontario Aboriginal Health Access Center, or SOHAC as it's more commonly referred to. So any of these organizations can do referrals and obtain consent for the by name list, and they all provide feedback on systems changes. The by name list is one piece of something we call coordinated access. And coordinated access is a system that allows us to provide matching of supports and housing to people who need it most. And what it's really about is providing a wraparound supports and a very consistent way of measuring needs and prioritizing the community need for individuals experiencing homelessness. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to get this coordinated access roadmap drafted up uh, in order to show uh, in a really simplified way how it works. And it's really all about identifying the who, bringing them to a common entry point where they can obtain information and get first um, access to services, prioritizing them based on their specific needs, and then matching them with appropriate housing. And that's gonna be different for everybody, whether it uh, is family size, uh, support needs, and things like that. I'll also mention here that one of the pieces of coordinated access that's so important is around providing the amount of support required for successful tenancies. Um, so we uh, take every position that we want people to have success. Uh, we don't want to set people up for failure, so to speak. So it's really important at every step of the way that we're engaging support services, which really speaks to the report we heard earlier around mental health and, and addictions. The Homelessness Response Steering Committee is a group of organizations that's come together to help make all this work possible. Uh, so they're engaged and at the table. We're working on strengthening our by name list and identifying and onboarding additional supports and housing providers. So with the goal being that we want people to have more choice around where they are, we want more availability, and we want faster opportunities for people so that our wait lists are moving along. So with the definitions out of the way, I can get into the enumeration findings. Uh, so I wanted to share with you that we had 142 people that completed our survey. And I'll start by saying um, all the survey responses are completely respondent led. So it's how they identify with themselves. Uh, right. Enumerators were supporting in way of definition because some of the language can be a little bit difficult. Uh, some of the questions are quite sensitive. Uh, so we were very respectful of that. And uh, so I just want everybody to know that we take the answers that the survey respondent is providing and there's no counseling provided around those responses. Of the 142 people that responded to our survey, 74 people or 52% indicated they were chronically homeless, which means experiencing homelessness for six months or more in the previous 12 month period. That does not have to be consecutive. Uh, it can be broken up and, and cumulative. Our highest priority on the by name list is unsheltered individuals experiencing chronic homelessness. We identified 27 people on the day of the enumeration that were experiencing unsheltered chronic homelessness. 
So um, more about sleeping arrangements. And when we look at the 142 responses that we received, uh, this is a breakdown of sleeping arrangements on the night of the enumeration. So the largest category you'll see is staying with others, which is also referred to um, by service providers as couch surfing. So staying with friends and family, temporary provisional accommodations. There was also quite a large number of individuals staying in motel, whether it be uh, self-funded or county funded. And then we had 17 people who uh, didn't wish to disclose where they were staying that night. Um, something I don't think we've talked about a lot in past reports or brought to this table is um, morbidity and contributing factors. And when we talk about morbidities, we're talking about things that lead to a higher level of vulnerability for people. Um, they're mostly related to health. And when you add them into something like homelessness or uh, unsafe provisional accommodations, it uh, can lead to much, much higher risks. Um, so this is something that we always look at when trying to prioritize housing and supports for people. Um, the way that the enumeration worked, we had uh, an outline of questions that we were required to ask to report back to the province on. So you'll see those listed under contributing factors. And that was individuals that identified as having certain uh, medical illnesses, physical limitations, um, cognitive or learning limitations, substance use or misuse, or a mental health concern. Uh, so those are self-identified. We further summarized those into the morbidities because there is a bit of overlap within those. And in total, we had 26 respondents that indicated they were experiencing trimorbidity on the day of the enumeration. And those are individuals that we would look at um, providing the most amount of support to because they really require it. A couple of brief uh, demographics uh, for you. Uh, age of our respondents, we did have three youth identified on the day of the enumeration who were experiencing homelessness, and they would be prioritized on the by name list uh, to be provided with the most expedient access to housing and support services. Uh, the bulk of our respondents were made up of cisgender males, and there is a breakdown of ethnicity as well. Uh, you will notice um, between identification of ethnicity, uh, there is a variation on the Indigenous line. We had 17 people that answered this question as identifying as Indigenous, um, but there was a separate question about uh, indigeneity uh, where we had 22 responses, and I'm going to talk about that in the priority groups. 73% uh, of all the people that uh, we spoke with on that day were in receipt of social assistance, um, so that's Ontario Works or ODSP. Um, so people that are on a certain level of income that can't afford things in the rental market. There was a few, um, I, I know what's surprising to some when I talk to service providers and let them know about the numbers that we find. There is individuals with full-time employment that are experiencing homelessness. It uh, could be for a number of reasons around accommodation needs with um, pets or family size, all, all sorts of things. And um, this question on the survey allowed more than one response. Um, so that's why the numbers uh, don't add up to 142. So I'm going to touch on three areas of focus, and these are uh, based on the information we received from the enumeration. I've already touched on one was unsheltered and chronic homelessness. So the 27 individuals that we identified as sleeping rough uh, and unsheltered, uh, they would be prioritized with the highest level. Uh, especially if they were chronic homelessness, and this was something that they've been experiencing for quite some time. Um, everybody is in a different situation, and we always go at this with a position of meet people where they're at. And if somebody's looking to access services, we're there to try and support them to access those services. Uh, there is always a number of individuals who uh, are not ready for that step. The second priority that we've identified is Indigenous homelessness. And I want to take a moment to talk about Indigenous homelessness because it's really important. Indigenous homelessness is defined different than the colonial Canadian definition of homelessness. Uh, and if you're interested in that, there is a bit of literature by a person by the name of Jesse Thistle, who is an Indigenous uh, person that wrote about homelessness and the 12 stages of Indigenous homelessness. And it's really important just to recognize here, uh, we did speak with our service providers following the enumeration, and it was clear to us that even though they work with many clients who would fall under the definition of homelessness, they don't consider themselves homeless. So there is an underrepresentation of 
or an overrepresentation, I'm sorry, of Indigenous homelessness in the area and across the province. Um, but the numbers of the enumeration don't necessarily reflect, reflect that accurately. So we had 22 people that identified that they were Indigenous and experiencing homelessness. Uh, this has been added as a prioritization, and we are lucky to have two primarily urban Indigenous uh, service providers sitting on our steering committee as well. And the last priority and something that really speaks to the need for supports is around the morbidities. And I touched on that in the enumeration results, um, but try morbidity and with added to somebody experiencing unsheltered homelessness, it leads to major vulnerability and something that we would prioritize quite highly and provide a lot of support to coming off a coordinated access system. So, uh, all of that um, is around trying to understand the by name list and coordinated access and how it works. And then now I wanna get into what we believe as a county we can do to better support that group of individuals. So our recommendation is to add homelessness as a prioritization model for rent gear to income housing. So provincially, there is one mandated prioritization that's for victims of domestic violence and human trafficking. We are allowed under the Housing Services Act to add additional priorities um, based on local rules. And we are recommending that we, we do that within Gray County. So there would be um, some rules around that, uh, specifically that the individuals would be on our by name list, part of our coordinated access system. We'd be prioritizing them on a one in 10 basis. So uh, for special priority and human trafficking would always be offered first as it's required. And then following that, every one in 10 units would be offered to somebody off of our my name list, alternating between those that were individuals and those were, that were families. Uh, we would do vacancy matching, which includes supports, uh, so that we could support them through external agencies as best that we could. Uh, and we housed last year, uh, we made just over 70 offers of housing to rent here to income housing. Um, so based on this model, it would be it would be the equivalent of around seven to eight people a year that we'd be able to house off our by name list. And what's the goal? So the goal of any uh, well built homelessness response system is something called functional zero, and it is an extremely long term goal. But I wanted to bring it forward because this is kind of the finish line, so to speak, the 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 end that we're all chasing is in this. And that has two requirements, inflow matching outflow for a period of three months, as well as fewer than three people on the home, uh, experiencing chronic homelessness on the by name list. So the prioritization of RGI housing will help us reach that goal. I wanna wrap up uh, with just a thank you to their community partners. We had over 50 volunteers for the enumeration that made this possible. And that was across 15 partner organizations. Uh, we had hub sites available that were offered through Ontario Works, Southeast Gray Community Health Center, Beaver Valley Outreach, the Meaford Food Bank, Safe and Sound, the Y, and O'Share. And without them, this wouldn't have been such a great success. Um, and in Mr. Dodd's presentation, Warden, you had mentioned around eviction. So quickly, I pulled up. There was 44 individuals that responded. They were in youth or foster care. Uh, and then we're experiencing homelessness. So I just wanted to tie that in for you and I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much for that, Josh. Um, you mentioned uh, when talking about indigenous uh, homelessness, you mentioned uh, um, something data by Jesse, what was that last name? It's Thistle. Can you spell that? T-H-I-S-T-L-E. Excellent, thank you very much. Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden, and thanks, Josh. Josh, couple of questions. Can you, if if I showed up at your doorstep with uh, you know two cents to my name, and I've got some cognitive uh, you know disabilities, and uh, you know maybe a mental health issue, tell me what the next month would look like. I don't have a place to stay. Can you tell me what the next month would look like for me, please? Yeah, absolutely. So depending on um, your specific needs, uh, we would explain the by name list to you. We would ask you for your consent to be added to the by name list so that we were able to communicate with all the partners at the table around supporting you. Um, if you were experiencing unsheltered homelessness at that time, 
we would look to connect you with our short-term shelter program that would put you in short-term shelter while we developed a housing plan. Uh, following that, the county offers assistance programs with uh, things like last month's rent and moving expenses, where we could help you secure something in the private market if that was uh, the option available. Uh, alternatively, depending on your support needs, maybe it's um, a different level of housing that you require. So if it was housing with related supports, we could try and connect you there. Um, and then it would just be really based on the person. Okay, thank you. So uh, my next question, how did you arrive at the one in 10 as uh, the right number? And you know, why isn't it three out of 10? That's a great question. Um, I think that we really wanted to be, we wanted to make an impact, which based on our enumeration numbers, we felt that seven per year would make a significant impact. Uh, but we also want to be aware of individuals that are currently housed that are um, not making ends meet and that have been on our wait list for four to five years, um, really struggling. And when we get to that chronological piece of the wait list, which is beyond prioritization, making sure that we, we do have access for, for all individuals on our wait list. So this um, one in 10 has been utilized in other areas of the province and uh, provides both an impact on the by name list, which allows us to support people as well as um, meeting the needs of our total chronological wait list that wouldn't be prioritized. Thanks, Josh. And can you just, uh, for council's benefit, uh, tell us what the wait list right now is? That would depend um, very much on the area that you were looking to reside and how many bedrooms. On average, it is between three and five years. Okay, thank you. Thank you, next is Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, thank you too, Josh, for this uh, um, very, very detailed uh, report. I, I did read this one uh, quite a few times just so that I had um, had an understanding of it. Two questions, if I might. If a person identifies individually as being homeless, yet is unsure of getting um, services or is hesitant of being um, placed on the um, uh, BLN, what, um, what encouragement or what approach would you take to provide education to an individual so that they perhaps would be able to benefit from the services. Thank you. So we would um, let them know what the list has to offer and what the purpose of the list is um, and how it could help them specifically. So really tying it into their goals. Um, and if it was um, housing and where that housing was tying into how the by name list could assist them to achieve that goal. If anybody was still hesitant and unwilling to consent to the by name list, it would not prevent access to service uh, in any regard. And anybody uh, can choose not to access one part of the service and still receive supports. Thank you for that. My second question is around the functional zero approach. Uh, does that functional zero impact on any way uh, to the um, the roadmap that you provide so well, that graphic really resonated with me. So with, within that graphic, is there um, an ability to identify where functional zero may take place? And I hope um, I'm having that understanding correct, thanks. Yeah, definitely. So the, the functional zero piece would um, be as part of the by name list, which is um, after the referral process. So it's part of the prioritization model. Um, so it would be at the stage um, prior to housing, prior to vacancy matching. So uh, every month we look at statistics around inflow and outflow. So the number of people that have inflowed to the by name list versus the number that we've been able to appropriately house and provide supports to. Um, I, I brought that forward because it is a really important goal. Uh, I want to stress that it's a really long-term goal uh, because we have a, a lot of work to get there. Uh, but mainly we just want to make sure that um, that is where we're headed. But it would be on that by name list and that prioritization piece. That's where we would see those statistics. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Keaton, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you, Josh, so much for that presentation. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, really incredible what we're facing here in Gray County. Um, I just wanted to ask your thoughts on sort of, I'll say, connecting the dots. Um, 
my bank manager came to me a little while ago and she was having a, a concern because someone was sleeping in the lobby overnight. And I, and I realized, you know, homelessness is impacting all of us as, as lower tiers. And uh, you know, I was able to make some suggestions to her about uh, who to reach out to. But I'm just wondering about the outreach and, and how you really um, get the word out, so to speak, to, uh, to help people know uh, where to turn to and what, uh, what the opportunities are for supports. And, and just how do we get that out to the general public? That's a great question. And that's something that we continue to work on um, every day. I've had conversations with Rob uh, Hatton, our communications manager, many times around how we can let people know about the services that are provided in the area. Um, that was one of the reasons that we um, had the roadmap drawn up so that we could get a better understanding of how the homelessness response system works. Because I think that there is a, a large part of the community, if you're not service providers or if you're not involved in the day to day, um, a lack of understanding around where to go. So that is something that we're working on um, by putting more information on our website. Um, we have talked about potentially some radio around what services we provide to get that out to the community. We're always looking at doing more outreach. Um, so if we get a call to the office around somewhere where people have been identified, then we um, send a team out to do some outreach there uh, and try and connect them to services. Thank you very much, Mr. Ward and Josh, yes. Excellent. I would also uh, add, if I might, uh, again, I'm reminded, 211. <laughs> I always uh, stress to people that's a great place to go. I know that locally here in Hanover, I, I heard from a minister who had talked about, uh, you know, putting out his own uh, credit card uh, to assist someone uh, to get a, a motel room. And we had to stress, and Anne Marie will probably remember that, that uh, you know, 211, call 211. Uh, they, they have a a lot of very good information to share. Okay, I don't see any other hands. So with that said, it's probably time for us to call the question on the motion before us. Is there anyone opposed? I do not see any hands and therefore that is carried. And I thank you very much. And Josh, thank you very much for that report. Very good. Okay, we're on to item seven. How are uh, feeling? Does anyone need a break? Wave your hand if you feel you need a break, you would like a break, okay. So why don't we then come back uh, at 12, 30. Would that be okay? I, I'm, I know it's lunchtime, so I'm, I'm trying to see if we can get us through uh, the agenda. Well, let's have a discussion about that. Why don't we? Are people feeling like you would have to have a lunch break uh, now? Or do you want to take, uh, say, a 10-minute break and come back and try to finish the agenda? Uh, see more people nodding their heads for coming back in 10 minutes. Okay, with that said, we'll uh, pick, take a break and we'll be back at 12.30. Sure. See you then. Turn off your microphones in your video.
All right. Looks like we pretty much have a quorum. Yes, you uh -huh. do, sir. Uh, Olivia, can you let me know if we're good to go? You are good to go, Warden Hicks. Thank you, Olivia. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, we'll turn next to the items that were uh, pulled for separate uh, discussion, uh, that being items, uh, well, we'll start off with item 5B, which is the award of uh, two tandem uh, trucks. Um, I guess we have to put that on the floor. Can I get a mover, uh, please, to put that item uh, forward? Moved by Councillor McQueen, move. seconded by Councillor Burley, uh, and Councillor Sewever. You're on. Yes, um, I was just looking at this, and I know we only got two two bids, and um, you know this is a fairly major, and one was non-compliant, and I'm just wondering. Um, how often is it that we we only get two bids for items of this size? And, you know, it, is it time to perhaps look at how we, um, you know, advertise these to try to get more bidders? Because um, certainly, you know, this is basically because there's one bid that's non-compliant. It's basically sole source. We're, we're not getting a lot of bids. So I, I'm just wondering, is there a way we could, you know, what does staff think about, um, you know, what can we do to get more bids and, and put more competition into the process? So Pat, do you want to deal with this? Yeah, I could try that. Um, through you, Mr. Warden. Yeah, it, I mean, it is it is sort of a niche market, some of these tandem, especially the roll-offs, right? It's, it's not something that, uh, you know, is that widespread. Um, in general, we've always got a pretty limited number of bids on these uh, large trucks. Um, that being said, I mean, the non-compliant bid, um, you know, is for certain things like battery location, the lumbar, the transmission. There were just certain things that, that our mechanics um, change in, this, in the spec um, that were just not included in the non-compliant bid. So, it, you know, it did give us a good idea what the price was. Um, I, I think it's a long way from saying it's kind of a single source. I mean, it was a bid. People had a chance to bid. Those industries know... Um, we've noticed it with vehicles a lot. Uh, the same people seem to get them over and over again. There's, there seems to be those volume dealers as well, like even with our pickups and stuff um, that other guys just sometimes decide they're not going to compete with because they can't. Um, so I don't, I, I don't feel like we're, I mean, obviously because of the, you know, the, the inflation right now and all that, it's over budget. But um, I don't know if, if purchasing wanted to talk some more about uh, increasing the number of bids, but, I, you know, I don't feel like we're getting kind of hosed because of, uh, you know, not having a whole bunch of bids. Thank you. Thanks very much. Anything else, Council? Mm. With that said, I think it's time to call the question on the motion to receive this report and to award the uh, tender as indicated. Is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, that is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, we're dealing with item uh, 5C now, which is the communications uh, strategy. I think that puts Rob on deck. And I need a mover to put it on the floor, please. Uh, moved by Councillor Robinson and seconded by uh, Councillor Hutchison. Uh, Rob, you've got the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, as some of you on Council will remember, Gray County did adopt our first communication strategy back in 2016. And some of you may have been a part of that process as well. Uh, that strategy, strategy was due to be updated in uh, 2021, however, due to staffing leaves of absences over the year and uh, just the inability to do in-person public engagement, we did push that update back. Um, today, I am asking for Council's approval to issue an RFP for the project to hire a consultant uh, to complete the, the project uh, in a timely fashion. Um, I'm hoping to have it completed in the summer of this year. Um, also, as you will see in the report, uh, I am proposing increasing the project budget uh, above what was budgeted in 2021. Um, and as you would have seen through the corporate asset management plan, uh, sorry, the uh, capital plan. 
the purpose for the increase is to ideally to expand the scope of the strategy. Um, our current strategy doesn't apply to the communications needs of the tourism department and Grey, Grey Roots Museum and Archives. But given the reorganization and centralization of uh, communications that has happened over the last year or two, I think it does make a lot of sense to include those high need functions this time around in the update. Um, as well in the report, you would have seen some of the deliverables, just to name a few, are identifying current communication strengths and weaknesses, reviewing our current plan and the practices and resources that we use, uh, interviews with the warden, the CAO, senior management team, many members of council, staff, and of course, engaging with the public and the media and just collecting general feedback on our practices. Um, I, I think the timing is good now as well. I know that we, we have regressed a little bit as far as the, uh, the pandemic situation goes, um, but I think that the world has changed quite a bit over the past few years. And through this process, I'm hoping that we can better understand how that has changed the demographics of our, our communities, particularly newcomers to our communities. Um, and how the preferences of residents and the public in general has changed so that we can be more effective in our outreach, outreach and engagement to the public. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I know that Councillor Silver has a question. I'll come to you next, Councillor Keegan. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ward. Um, so, uh, you know, I recognize the need to, to update the strategy. And I think, uh, you know, in general, our, our communications department does a great job. And, and I think we did streamline things by, uh, you know, bringing in the gray roots and so on. So the my question is, uh, could we not do this internally? Um, you know, I recognize also that the communications department is short one person, but um, the you know, certainly there's a lot of staff time consumed in, you know, you know, going out for an RFP, managing the consultant and doing all this work. And I think we, we do have the expertise internally to, uh, to, to do this. So I'm just wondering um, why we wouldn't do this internally. Madam CAO. Thank you. Um, I think there are a couple of considerations here, Councillor Soever. Um, right now, a considerable amount of, of Rob and his team's time is around supporting our long-term care homes and, and ensuring that that communication is, uh, is very timely. We're putting out multiple updates every single day, um, in addition to the, the regular um, overhead of communications work in the county. So there, there certainly is not excess staff capacity at this time, and we can't um, reasonably predict when that load is likely to lessen. Uh, the second piece is that I feel strongly that um, we bring in outside expertise, people who have the um, advantage and the experience to have had, um, you know, worked through, through these processes in, in similar sized communities and might bring um, insights and and, and policies that could really help us to move forward. Uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that you don't know what you don't know. And so we want to make sure that we're putting together the, the best and most current uh, strategy that we can to support the county in getting the word out. You just heard in the previous presentation today how important communication is, even to some very um, specific user groups like that homeless community. And this strategy is meant to really cover that, that whole range of, of, of people who um, need to hear and be informed about the work that the county is doing. So there are a number of reasons why um, I support um, moving forward with an external resource to help us move, move forward with this. Thank you. Anything else, Councillor Silver? No, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Keegan, you're next. Mr. Warden, and I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank Rob and your group for the great job you are doing with communications, the uh, updates to Council and to the public are appreciated. And I wanted to add that the Municipality of Meaford has just completed a communications strategy. We'll have the report on our agenda um, on Monday. And it's, it's really quite well done by letter M. And I just wondered, 
Rob, if, if you happen to have seen that or if you might have time to uh, read through the 200 and somewhat pages of the uh, report, because there is a lot of good information in there and, and just perhaps there's something that's transferable to the county. Uh, through you, Mr. Warden, I, I wasn't aware that the report was uh, on coming forward now, but I am actually uh, quite excited to, to hear that and I will definitely take a look through that. Um, our, through our purchasing manager, Mike Alguire, we actually have reached out to the local municipalities just to see what your um, municipalities and staff have been doing as well. And we did find out uh, that you were in that process. Uh, and uh, we'll be, I think, going back as well, just when we do go to issue the RFP to make sure that we are, are getting that in front of a lot of uh, good agencies. Very good. Are you good to go, Councillor Peabody? Yes, terrific. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Excellent. I don't see any other hands. So with that said, I'm going to call the question. Oh, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And I do appreciate this is just a, a, a question as I'm listening to um, Rob Hatton's responses. Um, having read the report, but just off, off the cuff, I'm asking the question in terms of will this um, uh, study also look at supporting uh, communication uh, technology? that may assist the county, the council, Gray County residents in order to um, use various venues to get communications out. I'm thinking, you know, our electronic format, but I'm sure there's much more out there. Wonder if you could elaborate on that, please. Uh, absolutely. I think through the scope of this review, we would will definitely be reviewing the tools that we are already using and looking at what else is available out there and uh, best practices that other similar sized municipalities are using so that we can communicate effectively. Um, just one example that I would like to look into a little bit further is uh, we know that we have a lot of success with our uh, push email system and we've been utilizing that a lot with long term care at the moment. Uh, and I'd like to look further into um, SMS notifications and text notifications, because I know that's how a lot of younger people are looking to receive it. Um, so that's just one example, but for sure that would be within the scope of the review. Thank you, Rob. Okay, I don't see any other hands. Going once, twice, it's gone. Time to call the question on the motion before us. Anyone opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. We will next move to item 5L, which is the correspondence from Bill Abbott's uh, on the widening of uh, proposed paved shoulders on Gray Road 13. Uh, I need a mover. Uh, I would like to get Councillor Gord Ignorum in, if I could. Would you be prepared to move that? <laughs> and the seconder, Councillor O'Leary. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Soever, you had a question there. Yes. Um, well, as, as most of you, uh, whoops, uh, as most of you on council know, Bill uh, is quite an avid uh, proponent of bicycling and, and active transportation. And he has submitted this letter, which came to us at uh, Blue Mountains Council, and then the council directed it be forwarded to Gray County Council. And um, so I'm just wondering um, if the, you know, there has been consideration of, of the wider shoulders in this area. Um, it, it does receive quite a bit of heavy pedestrian use. The sidewalks don't go all the way out there. Um, both largely the pedestrian use, uh, well, there's people jogging, but there's also the uh, seasonal workers. And um, there's also quite a bit of bicycle use here. So just wondering if this has received some consideration. I guess we'll turn to Pat, is Pat still working? Oh, there he is. Yep, yep, through you, Mr. Warden. Yeah, we uh, had, a, had an, another discussion with Bill Abbotts and uh, looked at the area again. Uh, yeah, we're gonna put 1.5 meter paved shoulders there, which uh, you know is you know kind of the width of a sidewalk and uh, the width that would satisfy book 18. Um, for, for a bike lane for the paved shoulder, right? So it's not an actual bike lane, it's the paved shoulder, of course. But um, one thing I just wanted to mention, just, you know, this, the cycling and trails uh, uh, group that is going to be formed hopefully here in 2022 um, should help us with some of these communications as well, um, getting them out to the bike folks and, and kind of finding out, you know, where their key priorities are and, and what they see as the routes um, 
going forward that are most used by uh, their folks. So um, yeah, I, th I think Bill was relatively happy with the 1.5, although obviously he'd take more, but sometimes the platforms just don't hold it or you know, maybe 80% of it you could put in 1.5, but all of a sudden there's a couple hundred meters that you couldn't go to two meters without putting in a couple hundred thousand dollars of platform widening. So I think 1.5 is a good compromise and probably a good idea from Bill. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and, and just to follow up, Ms. Ward, um, do we have any capability when we're doing traffic measurements of measuring uh, bicycle and foot traffic at the same time? I know that the Ministry of Transport has these cameras that they put out at the Craigleith uh, Park, uh, Provincial Park, where, you know, they could actually record all of the uh, pedestrian, uh, bicycle and traffic interactions. Because increasingly in our touristed areas, um, it's that the issue is not only the traffic, but it's also the interaction with other users of the road, which probably we didn't have a lot of in, in the past, but increasingly you see people jogging, biking on, on our county roads and they're not really designed for that. But, you know, the fact is that it does happen and it is a, a safety issue. So do we have any capabilities of, uh, you know, measuring uh, foot traffic and uh, bicycle traffic? Uh, through you, Mr. Warden, I can just answer on behalf of transportation. Um, our, our, our counters are basically radar counters, so um, they don't really differentiate between a bike, you know, and a, and a vehicle, for example. Um, I know uh, tourism had bought some, uh, through a grant, we had bought some bike counters, but I think they're still generally radar counters. We kind of went through this a couple of years ago where um, there's always that argument, you know, somebody drives a certain place and, and says, oh, I see a lot of pedestrians or, or, or cyclists going through there. And another guy says, well, I've never seen any there. Right. So it is hard. Like that is important. Um, and it is hard to get. And right now we don't really have that uh, capability to really count exactly how uh, short of going out for a day and just doing, you know, a peak hour count or something, um, which, you know, is, you know, unless you get a big sample size, you're, you've got some issues there maybe. But uh, right now, yeah, we don't really have cycling counts anywhere or pedestrian counts for that matter. Thank you. Uh, perhaps it's something that we may consider in the future. There's more and more technology and it's becoming less and less obtrusive because the large trailer with the camera that the Ministry of Transport put out at the uh, provincial park although I'm sure it collected a lot of good data as people saw this big thing beside the road, uh, they were slowing down. So I'm not sure <laughs> the speed data, it would be reliable anymore because, uh, you know, people are reacting to, to the presence of the, the large uh, camera structure. Right. And cameras are, uh, through you, Mr. Warren, cameras are really dependable enough now, you know, uh, like with our MyoVision, you can, you can kind of send the data off and they'll count it for you, um, you know, it, it really probably is something we should uh, look at just to increase our data rather than just, because even I know, I know Bill points to Strava quite a bit um, and that's a good source of data, but that is a very specific um, bike user. Typically, you know, the, the person with his, with his two kids doesn't necessarily have Strava say, right. Um, so it's hard to know exactly, not necessarily just what traffic's there, but the type of traffic um, makes a difference too, really. Thank you. Okay, and I didn't see Savannah in our list because I thought she might have been uh, on the bicycle people. She's not here today. Okay, but that might be somebody, Council Slever, to follow up with. Or perhaps Randy or somebody could let Savannah know that that might be something she could yeah. discuss with Council Slever. Through you, Mr. Warden, uh, definitely we'll follow up with uh, tourism staff. Uh, we do have um, trail counters, so we have been collecting some data and information in some of our trails. Um, I don't know if they can be uh, utilized uh, for any for any counting of roads, because I think, as Pat indicated, I think it's it's just counting those that are crossing uh, through that that whether it's a laser or, or just picking up the 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 motion from those uh, those counts. So, uh, but something we can explore further for sure in terms of how we can collect data. And like Pat said, we have used Strava and other data sources in the past to try to get a sense, anyways, of of what our pedestrian traffic is at least on our trail systems, um, as well as on our roadways. So that's something that we can definitely explore further. Okay. 
All good, Councillor Silver? Yes, that's fine. Thanks. Thank you. I don't see any other hands, so perhaps it's time for us to call the question on the motion before us. Uh, anyone opposed to the motion? No hands, so I'm going to say that that is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to item uh, seven in the agenda. Uh, 7A, or we were going to talk about uh, OGRA and the date has been moved. Uh, uh, Kim, I think you were going to speak to this. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Borden. Um, as many on council are aware, I think uh, yesterday it was formally announced that the OGRA conference has been shifted to April. So I'm anticipating that um, we'll get a, an updated deadline for submission of delegation requests a little closer to that date. Um, but certainly happy to uh, receive any thoughts from, from members of council about delegations that um, had been top of mind for them that, and we can uh, just start a list uh, that we can finalize closer to the time. Um, I could put one on the table, which I think is of course with MTO and with regard to the Highway 26 corridor. Um, recently we've seen um, some correspondence from the ministry that they were um, moving forward with some plans on Highway 26. I think we'd like to revisit those in light of um, earlier insights that, that we did provide to the province to ensure that uh, the plan, their plans and our wishes are, are aligning. Okay, very good. Um, perhaps while we have you Kim, you can continue with 7B. Uh, are you gonna be providing that COVID-19 update? I can, I can. Um, certainly um, from further to our emergency control group meeting um, earlier um, last week, um, we are fortunate that um, the situation amongst the, the bulk of the staff team is, is stable. Um, we have incidents um, within our staff complement, um, but we're able to uh, manage those absences and making sure that everybody has the support that they need. Um, you're all receiving frequent updates um, with regard to the situation in long-term care. Um, and uh, all three homes are, are considered in outbreak at this time. And we're, you know, everybody's working as hard as they can to make sure that um, we have the, the staff that we need, um, but all of the appropriate and highest level precautions are, are being taken right now to try and do everything that we can to uh, minimize this, the spread of, in, of infection in the homes. So um, here we are. If I think if we, if we had one wish, it, it would be that uh, the, the testing, the PCR testing, um, those results are a little bit slow coming back. And uh, we're hoping that, you know, as the situation goes forward, that perhaps there'll be a few more resources put towards that so that we can see those results a little bit more quickly. I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has them. Sorry, I'm still muted. Are there questions from anyone? None. Uh, we're on to item number eight. Are there any uh, notices of motion? I see none. Oh, Councilor Matthew. Uh, thanks, Mr. Gordon. I'm not sure whether this needs to be a notice of motion, but you know, just further to our earlier discussions this morning with uh, Mr. Phil Dodd and uh, uh, your inaugural address. What are your thoughts, Mr. Warden, on developing a uh, whether it be a task force or a committee? And if uh, if that's uh, a route that we want to take, this council wants to take, does it require a notice of motion? It, it well, I'm going to speak for the Madam Clerk, but she's nodding, and I'm going to say it definitely would require a notice of motion. It might be appropriate, Councillor Mackey, that you indicate uh, a notice of motion just in case uh, we decide we're moving um, to establish some kind of a task force or committee or whatever. Uh, we can always withdraw it if, if need be. But the plan was to have a conversation with uh, our CAO and with Barb. Um, and with yourself uh, and uh, to have some sort of preliminary discussion about where this thing may be headed. But I don't think it's inappropriate that you give a notice of motion just in case uh, we need to use it. Okay, I'm certainly prepared then to give that notice and hopefully uh, within the next uh, 
week or so, Barb, uh, Kim, uh, yourself and myself can uh, get together and have dis discussions on uh, maybe how we move this agenda forward. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, Barb, I saw you pop up. Were you wanting to say anything there or you're satisfied? No, thanks, Mr. Warden. I'm just available if needed. Excellent. Okay. Um, are there any other uh, notices of motion? Seeing none, then I will go for the uh, adjournment. It is moved by Councillor O'Leary and seconded by Councillor Burley uh, that we adjourn. Uh, anyone opposed? I do not see any hands. I want to thank everyone for your time. Good meeting, uh, good discussions, and have a great day. And watch out for the ice. Yeah. Okay, no slippery. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye now.